All right, well, welcome everyone. We're glad that you are here. Thanks for joining um, and being part of the seminar. My name is Kristen Miller and I'm a faculty member here at the American Public University System in the Space Studies Department. And I'm also the lead faculty advisor for the APUS Analog Research Group. And I'm pleased to introduce this panel on the value and potential for space analog research. So um, just to give you a little background, a space analog is a habitat here on Earth that has been designed to mimic aspects of the space environment. So space analogs provide an opportunity to test technologies, to develop procedures, um, to evaluate the human response to long-term tenure in space-like environments um, at a much lower cost uh, and much greater accessibility than actual space habitats. So they have a lot of value and um, there's a lot of exciting research that can be done in them. And in the panel today, um, we're going to talk about the different types of space analogs that are out there, the different kinds of um, research that can be done in the different analogs, and we're going to hear about um, three exciting analog programs. So our first speaker will be Dr. Arnold Nikogosian. Um, Dr. Nikogosian served as the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Associate Administrator for Life and Microgravity Sciences. Um, he was designated as the Agency Health and Safety Official he was the chief, uh, a former chief medical officer and senior advisor for health affairs. He managed and funded an extensive portfolio of research and development in the areas of space biology, medicine, physics, and chemistry. And he was also responsible for the oversight of the NASA Workforce Occupational and Astronauts Health Programs. Dr. Nika Gosian is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, the American College of Preventive Medicine, Aerospace <coughs> Medical Association, the American Astronautical Society, and a full member of the International Academy of Astronautics. He has received numerous awards and medals from the U.S. and foreign governments for contributions to education and humanitarian help using telemedicine. And we are honored to have him as part of our panel today. Um, so, I, Dr. Nikosi, and I will I will turn the time over to you. Um, Arnold, I, I think you're muted. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. thank you very much. I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, uh, Kristen, you were very generous in my, your uh, statements, and uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate working at IPUS, APUS and with all of you. So um, I will be, can you see my slides? Okay. So I will be talking, I have a couple of slides to talk, or four slides, to talk about uh, analog research on habitats. I will uh, uh, I will uh, narrow my statements to uh, NASA and not go out of it. But uh, if you remember last year, we had the same session, and I used a slide that from my publication here that uh, talks about analog and uh, uh, and simulations, and uh, it's a NASA perspective. Basically, it's from my textbook. I updated it from last year. Uh, the things in uh, the statements in yellow are uh, the ones which are, uh, uh, well, uh, we can uh, reproduce well on Earth. The one in black are not being able to reproduce well on Earth, but uh, reduced gravity and radiation are primarily viewed in, uh, uh, presented by the space station. Uh, so you can see in test bed categories what the analogs are high fidelity and uh, medium fidelity and low fidelity. And uh, you will see that the facility type are different. They go from centrifuges to, um, to enclosures, to habitats, to uh, like ARG or whatever, uh, and whatever, uh, APUS and Kristen and uh, and uh, Ed uh, running at, uh, uh, with uh, Mars analogs, and people will be here to talk about that. Uh, but uh, what are the research which are used in those analogs is on the ground. The ones on the ground are primarily for uh, crew interaction, psychosocial per performance, work uh, schedules and work uh, uh, and fatigue, and also more so, you look at your equipment performance. And NASA has been very, and I will be talking tomorrow at the keynote talk about the Skylab 
medical altitude uh, test, which preceded the Skylab mission. And as you know, NASA has been using training facilities and analogs for a long period of time. And uh, especially the water immersion facility, which is now called the Sonny Carter um, uh, Water Immersion Facility, where the astronauts practice extravehicular activities. And uh, also the remote, uh, the, uh, the uh, stations where they can practice remote manipulators and different tasks that they will be doing on orbit. Uh, the rescue, uh, we used to have a water emergency and water rescue capability, which was uh, basically if a command module splashes in the ocean, how do you get out? And the crew was to train on those. And I think that we just started doing that with uh, SpaceX, which lands on water, like in the old good days. Okay, so what is the international facility? One, there is one facility which is located in Moscow at the Institute of Biomedical Problems that where uh, we worked there, a representative of the Soviet Union Medical Research Laboratory, one of the two, uh, the other one is at Star City, run the, by the military, and this group is run by Academician National Academy of Science, uh, and uh, they run a multinational, international, if you wish, 500-day um, simulation of uh, sky, of uh, Mars mission analogs, and uh, provide the communication delay, like all of them, and uh, use cultural diverse crews from Europe, Russia, China, and Japan that I don't have here. This is the picture of the uh, chambers. And uh, one of the anecdotes about that, cultural diversity, is that uh, you don't pass vodka in New Year's into the, uh, into the analog simulation, and uh, the diversity end up with uh, a female European astronaut uh, or participant astronaut being harassed. There are two new facilities that NASA, well, one new and one refurbished, refurb something new, something cool. <laughs> so this one is the, um, is the Mars analog, which is in the backyard of the Johnson Space Center. It's a, a 3D printed facility, covers close to an acre, and the crew, uh, you can see here, it's a very, it's a diverse crew. It has uh, some of them have a military background, some of them are biologists, one of them is engineer, and one is physician. And um, um, let's see, uh, yeah, and uh, there uh, and there is a uh, let's see, Kelly, Kelly has uh, Kelly uh, Haston is uh, the commander. She is an accomplished pilot, an accomplished pilot from the military. And uh, they are going to, they have been just locked into the chamber for uh, uh, one year exposure. And uh, uh, they are going to be participating using some hardware and testing some hardware and doing some experiments and training. And this one, the high seed, the Hawaiian uh, laborator, uh, simulation laboratory, uh, which was used for as a Mars simulator is being to is being uh, reshaped and reformatted to be a lunar laboratory. So there is a lot of benefit uh, using uh, analogs, and as I will be talking tomorrow um, uh, afternoon, uh, the Skylab benefited significantly. So is the International Space Station. So is the shuttle. M many mission simulations have uh, removed some problems in hardware or performance and uh, help assist developing realistic schedules. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arnold. That was a fantastic overview of the some of the different analog facilities and, and the kind of research that we can do with them. We really appreciate um, you giving us that perspective. Um, our next speaker is uh, Noah Lloyd. Noah is the program manager of the American Public University System Analog Research Group, or ARG. Um, he is specializing in human spaceflight research. 
um, within simulated planetary environments. Uh, Noah is a Space Force veteran and systems engineer at Sierra Space. He currently resides in Denver, Colorado, where he's pursuing a Bachelor in Space and Aerospace Science at APUS. So Noah, I'll let you go ahead and win with your presentation. Yeah, hey, thanks guys, absolutely. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Awesome, so as Dr. Miller said, I am the APUS program manager. Um, the group here focuses mainly of students, the student-led organization at um, the American Public University System, a subchapter of the uh, AIAA, American Institutes, for aeronautic and astronautics. Um, and essentially we're, we're an online university, APUS, um, consisting of both American Military University and a pu American Public University, um, which, you know, really, what's really unique about this online school is the fact that we are able to bring in so many expertise from both the civilian sector and the military sector, having that AMU and APUS body. So, so what ARG does is it focuses the talents and skills of the APUS student body and applies them at a, a lot of various uh, simulated habitats um, across the country. So um, what the purpose of the organization would be is to not only uh, prepare students for what a Martian or a lunar simulus, uh, simulation might be like um, to prepare for research, um, but to also develop a lot of the uh, students there that are passionate in you know, all things STEM and engineering application and scientific application, uh, chemistry sciences application at a robust, um, at a multitude of robust, uh, or I'm sorry, a multitude of sites with a lot of robust research um, that can apply through uh, multiple different um, research locations. But, you know, fostering that ability of mentors from the uh, military side and and um, the, the veterans of even the civilian sector and industry um, with students coming into, you know, space studies or um, some type of other STEM field in the APUS um, School of STEM um, is, is really the goal to, to link like minds and um, experts with people who are passionate about this field so that they stay engaged um, and can apply a lot of what they're learning in class and, and what they've learned in the industry and what they've learned in uh, government and uh, military sector to uh, human spaceflight research is essentially the goal. So as we said, it's it's mainly student managed and faculty advised. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And a lot of our um, other industry advisors as well. Um, from uh, APUS alumni um, that bring in a lot of that expertise to us. So, so um, that's that's essentially what the organization looks like. It's student led with a lot of advisors, and it's scalable to meet the needs and demands of uh, AARG at any given time, especially with the amount of uh, student body participation constantly changing, um, and different uh, you know different SMEs and um, subject matter experts and and advisors are, are able to kind of pop in and pop out depending on uh, what research needs um, uh, on any given research needs at, at that moment. So, you know, as any organization, it goes um, up and down with, with the amount of uh, research coming in, whether it be from students coming up with it within the American Public University system, or um, sometimes uh, you'll, you'll have outside um, industries that are looking to test out some of their equipment in some analog habitat sites. The organization consists of uh, the program manager, uh, lead faculty advisor, um, chief of staff, and then you have, that's more of a staff side that can maintain continuity of training, uh, recruitment, communications uh, throughout multiple missions. And then you have the more um, operational leadership side, which is our uh, flight directors and our crew commanders, our deputy flight directors, and our risk managers. So these people can be changing from mission to mission. Um, they're trying to get a taste of what it's like to be an analog astronaut. They're, um, some people come into the program wanting to learn more about managing, you know, wanting to learn more about training and risk mitigation and some extreme uh, locations. Um, like Mars Desert Research Station out in remote Utah. And then some people want to come in and stay more on the uh, 
the emission side as an analog astronaut and um and put their skills to use in the operational field. So they would be mission specialists, they could be mission commanders, um, and then they could be flight directors. And then, you know, if you want to um, be a part of the organization throughout multiple missions, you're usually a part of um, the, uh, the staff side, under chief of staff. So, so our missions, we've had five, four missions to Elma. We're coming up on our fifth this weekend. Um, and the, these are our first three mission patches at Elma. These are our upcoming or our, our fourth mission patch and our upcoming fifth mission patch. Um, ARG 5i. And then ARG 1M um, was our first mission to the Mars Desert Research Station, and that happened last year. So some of our presence at ILMA um, is, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's, the, the scope is large. We have a working relationship with the University of North Dakota's inflatable wow. lunar Mar uh, Martian analog habitat. Um, so the cool thing about this partnership is students are really able to leverage um, long duration uh, or multiple um, medium duration mission uh, research applications at ELMA. So you can have a sleep study, you can have a plant study, you can have an electrolysis chemical study, you can have a human factor study, EVA studies um, at ELMA multiple times throughout the year uh, to really uh, bring continuity throughout the research um make sure that you know it would tweak some fixes of research application from one mission to the next that's um you know uh that's what is the capable with our collaboration there at the university of north dakota and there's been some really cool research that have gone through um there's been a lot of different plant study researches focusing on okay well if you're in a analog environment on mars or the moon and you have a limited access to resources, well, you know, what are some of the resources that you can use to recycle from the crew? And uh, that, was, that could be human manure. Um, so there's been some plant studies with that that have had some successful results. Um, we've also had some cardio breath studies there at Elma, which is a cooperation with um, Simon Fraser University, studying different physiological effects um, based on heart rate, blood oxygen levels, and a lot of different vital readings while analog astronauts, <clears throat> excuse me, are in the habitat. We've also had some really cool uh, spirulina algae research um, come up. And I won't speak to that too much, but it's some, some pretty uh, incredible accomplished research that I know um, Terry will probably be speaking to a little bit later. Um, but that was started under uh, the APUS's a supernova research group, but ARG helped facilitate that with uh, bringing, bringing that study onto one of our missions at OMA. So some really cool stuff. Um, EVA, uh, EVA search and rescue um, research applications, trying to look at what is the best way to uh, mitigate stress and also um, mitigate physiological effects onto an astronaut when conducting an EVA uh, rescue. Um, what are the best ways to to kind of hold and, and lift that um, astronaut in need of, of rescue or or maybe there's some equipment that can go within the, some of the uh, University of North Dakota's NDX2 spacesuits um, that will make the suit more manageable to uh, use for long distance travel, easier on the body. A lot of different applications there. Un University of North Dakota has a as an awesome uh, facility and awesome cooperation with ARG there. Yeah. Now, some of our application research out of the Mars Desert Research Station, um, this was some of our presence there at our, our last mission. And there's, you know, of applications, ARG, ducks, even um, MDRS, and, and that's from heliophysics and astronomy to more EVA and human factor spacesuit applications and, and rescue uh, techniques and a Martian-like terrain. Um, we have um, studies on the facility itself and determining, you know, what is the most effective. And we've had some um, more... Uh, plant studies as well, studying seeds, uh, NASA space seeds that are actually on orbit for a few years 
and and bringing it back down and uh, planting those seeds in a different mixtures of soil with uh, different nitrates and phosphates and um, some different elements that you could bring to Mars to grow. Um, we've also had some really amazing logistical experiments, applications from some Air Force uh, education with industry fellows that were uh, students at APUS that were able to apply some large-scale Martian logistical uh, um, studies to see if you had a supply cache drop, how does that extend an astronaut's uh, reach for geological studies or whatever that study may be. Um, and, you know, if, if something goes wrong as orbital mechanics, many things can with getting a successful supply drop on Mars to astronauts. Um, will, will a, what, what would a supply cache need to have for nutritional value to an extent um, an astronaut's uh, stay outside of the habitat during an emergency situation when they need to get back to um, the main habitat, but the supply cache was dropping much further. You know, we did some physiological studies there too. So all in all, AARG is a, a really unique organization that is able to bring a bunch of online students with multiple expertise all across the country and world together to apply their skills and their analog sites. So these are some of our crew pictures that we have had at um, Elma and MDRS. So fine, fine looking gangs there with uh, lots of expertise. Um, and then some of our upcoming missions that we are excited about in ARG would be our continued collaboration with the University of North Dakota at Elma and um, Aquarius mission coming up, pirate mission at a FI, Florida International University's Aquarius um, underwater laboratory out of, out of Key Largo, Florida. So there's a lot of training that goes into that one as well, of course, um, but that's, that's the uniqueness of ARG is that we have this program staff side of online students that is able to help train analog astronauts for each mission um, and help facilitate risk management on the mission side and prepare crews as much as they can for the stresses of uh, some of these habitats that we go to some of the more extreme ones like Aquarius and MDRS, as well as having a research coordination team and strong fact that can really make sure that the research we're sending makes sense, um, that it's credible. And, you know, the um, the sophistication and, and complication of, of these researches um, is, is really evidenced by what some of the conclusions that our students have come up with and, and some of the successful um, grants that, that we've been able to bring in because of those as well. So it's, um, I can't, I can't boast the, the organization enough. Um, there's some really stellar people uh, of, um, a part of it here. And um, the fact that it's online is what makes it so much cooler too. So yeah, just wanted to thank everyone for their support here and for always keeping an eye on what ARG is doing. Um, and if you're interested in following us some more and seeing what um, future sites we're going to, which there's more in the works than just Aquarius and Elma, um, those are just our official next sites, um, please follow us on our social media pages. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Miller. And let me know if there's any questions too. Absolutely, I think we'll do most of the questions at the end. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Noah. Um, and I'll, I'll let you take over. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Kristen and Noah and Arnold. Uh, great presentations. And one, one of the cool things about the American Public Universities ARG program, our analog astronaut program, is we have a collaboration uh, between faculty and students. And we have our students um, like Terry and Noah really drive the program. And so we're really excited to, to be able to facilitate uh, such a program for our students. 
Okay, so we'll uh, transition over to our next speaker, Terry Trevino. And Terry is currently a PhD student who holds a master's degree in science in space studies from the American Public University System. And his expertise or concentration when he was working on his master's degree was in aerospace science with heavy emphasis on space operations. Mr. Trevino was recently appointed to the AIAA uh, Space Systems Technology or Technical Subcommittee. Terry, Terry has been very, very active in the space yeah. community. And yeah. Like many of us, caught the space bug at I uh, early and haven't gotten rid of it yet. And I yes, me, me either. I, I, I got to give everybody credit here because all of you have been a part of this endeavor. And uh, you, you, we don't need to go into that ridiculous. <laughs> uh, very, very, very good. Um, and, and let me just say also, Terry is our um, observatory assistant for the APUS Wally Boston Observatory. Uh, where he defended his thesis on exoplanets and eclipsing binary stars, uh, utilizing our telescope. And he also leads several space studies organizations, including our Supernova Research Group. Um, and he has received um, the AIAA uh, a certification in propulsion, uh, propulsion engineering, launch vehicle design, habitat architecture, and astrodynamics. So with that, Terry, we'll hand it over to you. Brilliant, Dr. Albine. Amazing. None of this happens without Dr. Miller, let's be honest. <laughs> be real candid. I'm going to share my screen. Here we are. <clears throat> so I, I was a, a member of the original founding group of uh, AARG. Uh, thanks to and a shout out to Scott Van Noy, wherever he is on the planet, usually somewhere. Uh, Dr. Miller took us under her wing, and here we are today. It is, it has become quite the um, the experience. And and to be very candid, I work for Dr. Miller, just so everybody knows. Anyway. Uh, all the pretty logos, uh, our mission patch up in the upper right hand corner. I put the NASA meatball logo there because Dr. Miller and I did just receive a, uh, a significant grant and uh, we're going to use that for studying algae in a closed loop system. I went on this mission in, um, in June and um, it actually started much earlier than that. We started working on this mission um, in 2021. <clears throat> the, the Devon Island, so these, this is a great con compare contrast, right? So you've got, <clears throat> you got, this is a, uh, this, I don't know if anybody saw this, this is a, a Curiosity rover image that was a wide field, just came out on Tuesday. Um, and I just brought it in and showed it because it reminded me that that's, Devon Island on the right, and then there's Mars, and you just, it's just a shocking similarity, and to me, it was amazing. We did sit there every day and think, wow, this is probably exactly what Mars will look like when we were up in Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic, and, and it was just an amazing endeavor. The, the mission itself was a, a five-person team. There had only been 75 other people previously over the 23 years that the that the facility has been there in the Arctic. Uh, we were five of those. Uh, Andrew Wheeler is our commanding officer. He's from Australia, Olivia uh, from London and uh, UK. And then Andy and Caleb were uh, um, their engineers at a very large space company, aeronautics company out of Seattle. I can't really say anything else. The, uh, the team itself, here we are. I love this, the way this works. This is brilliant. <laughs> uh, here we are, <clears throat> day one, about 30 minutes into the mission. And we were smiling like this at the end, by the way. We, you know, one of the things you realize when you land there is there's nobody else to rely on. It's just us. 
not a human to be seen, not a human centric design anywhere. And I think that to me was probably one of those aha moments when we landed, but uh, here we are smiling and happy. Just so everybody knows, uh, North Pole up in the blue, the dark blue up here, Devon Island, you can kind of see it. it looks like a shoe boot, a, a kid when I say that. Uh, it's a long way away from San Francisco, I can tell you that. Greenland, just to the right. Uh, a little more closely, you know, kind of visible. Is, you know what's interesting is this is the archipelago of the Arctic. <clears throat> All these different islands are surrounded by ice. Everywhere you looked, there was uh, ice in the water. Uh, you can see I'm a long way away from home, and I did feel like that too. The island is massive. It's five times the size of the big island. It's really overpopulated. There's, it's zero, and uh, not a human living in there uh, on that island at all. And I, I, my imagine, I imagine the reason for that is it is it's quite inhospitable. The, uh, <clears throat> the distance to the North Pole, which is just up here to the left, was only 1,100 kilometers. I laugh, only 1,100 kilometers. Uh, average annual temperature minus 16, and the language is the Inuktitut, and this is actually what De this means, Devon, right here, up in the upper left hand corner. You can see where my mouse is. Sorry, <laughs> I had I had fun playing with those. Close up of the island, there's still an ice shelf that's uh, quite active. And uh, <clears throat> down here in the harbor, there is a, a memorial. It's called the Hope Memorial. It stands to this day. We did not see it other than flying over it. And, uh, and then of course, here's the, the crater. The interesting part of what Mars Society has done with this mission is they've landed right on the edge of a, of a major crater that struck 20, well, this, this meteorite struck 23 million years ago, approximately. But this gives you an idea of how close we are to Elsamere, Elsamere Island, where people actually do live here in Greece, of Ford, and then Craig Harbor. Um, here's another close up of the crater. It's actually quite large. It was a direct hit, and you can kind of see the, the crinkling and the, and the, you know, the effects, the net effects it had in the area there. All these images are courtesy of Google Earth. Day, this is early on. This is probably day or three or four. We've actually had the uh, wind turbine up and running by that time. I own and operated by the Mars Society. Um, you know, as far away as we are, it's just a, an amazing place. You just can't, uh, can't get over how devoid of life it is. And it looked like this everywhere, this hummocky uh, stone that looked like it's been overturned and just landed right after the, uh, after the strike. And this is a wide view, 180 degree wide angle of the crater. It's 20 kilometers to the other side. You can't uh, even make it out, but it's there. It's also interestingly 1.7 kilometers deep at its deepest spot, which you would have thought it would have been much deeper, but I'm, I'm assuming that this, this asteroid or comet wasn't that big. It did strike during the Miocene period. so. A lot of the um, of the fossils that we see here are are what were previously underwater, and you can kind of see um, a lot of coral actually, which was odd to see coral up along these these edges of this crater. There's no erosion around there because there's no water flow because it doesn't rain. Uh, it rains five to ten inches per year there. Uh, it took us a little over eighteen months to put the mission together. Uh, we did do an early flyover just to make sure there were no polar bears in the area because that would uh, that would clearly scare most of us. And they don't fear humans, so they come right up to you. And uh, I imagine if you smell like food, they'll eat you. Interesting to me, being kind of a, an astrobiologist in training, uh, you look and you see no obvious life anywhere. And then you start really looking and you can kind of see these, these, these plants popping up in odd places. Uh, this is the Arctic poppy. Uh, it even has some stem hairs here. You can see where it collects water out of the air. It is a Arctic desert. And that's the reason why I think Dr. Zubrin from the Mars Society picked this location because it's so devoid of life in general. You, you do find it. Uh, there's this 
cute little lemming here. And we did see obvious signs of them. They like to eat this cushion plant. So you can see it eating on something there. Uh, but this grows near the algae mats and algal mats. And then it also grows near most of the major water sources. Very succulent for as tiny it is. And as quick as it has to replicate and grow because the growing season there is maybe 45 to 60 days. The station itself needed a lot of work. Uh, and one of the things that, and the reason why I was picked for this mission is I've got a bunch of mountain climbing and uh, expeditionary experience. And I kind of knew how to do quite a bit of the, uh, of the on the ground logistics. And that's why they chose me. And, uh, and it took a lot of work to get just to the station itself. It took five flights a lot of different types of airplanes landing in really strange places. And, uh, and you can see the lads here. Uh, so this is Andy. He's actually working to belay uh, Caleb, who's at the top of our radio tower. And he's uh, actually removing this failed antennae that was up there. Because the winds can get crazy. They can get up to 70 and higher kilometer per hour there. We had a lot of work to do with the roof leaks that they were working on when they were up on the roof and there was a lot of mold. And so this is Olivia and I, we had full PPE. Uh, I actually had a set of the, um, the gas mask or whatever you call that. Um, but uh, I think this was day two or three. So I was getting tired of not being able to breathe. So I changed into the other mask, but uh, Caleb called us the team that broke the mold. Love that. We spent seven nights outside of the station, which was a bit unnerving. So we actually installed, installed what's called a bear fence around. It's a wire, it's a trip wire. Uh, and when it trips, it uh, emits a 12 gauge blank that is desperately loud. But thankfully it was there because uh, we, spent, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time in these tents after uh, 10 or 11 every night. This was taken at 11 at night. You can see how bright it is. The sun never sets. And I can tell you that we had to work around that because I would be live and up and wide awake at 11 and 12, unless we closed those windows upstairs, which we did. Uh, we covered them up. This is uh, the lads working on everything. They fixed everything. It had been six years since anybody had occupied the facility, uh, COVID in between. So you can kind of see them there. Uh, they were brilliant. They fixed uh, literally, they had to repair some of the um, awful stuff too, like the toilet and the place where all this sewage and stuff goes anyway. But uh, these Arctic cats are, they're amazing. You have to have them up there. Unfortunately, we're not, uh, uh, we're not carbon free up there. We, we hope one day to be, but we're not yet. Uh, I love this image because it gives you kind of an idea of the vast nothingness and there's no obvious life anywhere to be seen no trees uh, there actually are trees but they grow about two inches high and they spread way way out they spread out for sometimes uh, meters and they could be hundreds of years old but uh, we didn't see any here because we were up in the higher plane uh, this is olivia standing on the edge of the uh, kind of a little valley and there's a creek down below she's taking an image of this outcropping here which oddly was the result of something else we located just below there. And here it is. Uh, part of our mission director was to look for stromatolites, not just algae. Uh, we found one. I actually stumbled on the stone, practically fell over. Uh, not because it was something fascinating, because it was in the way. Uh, you can see it's, um, it's stromatolite. And if anyone knows how these things form, it takes millions of years for them to form these mats and these these lines and uh, you know there's no idea what this is we geolocated it we'll come back and and get some carbon dating on this specimen eventually uh, there was another specimen found in greenland this is the uh, paper on it i've also included the link here uh, this was 3.7 billion years old the link was uh, right here if you guys can see it and it'll also uh, if you get if you give i can get slides to you if you want to Look at this, 3.7 billion years. So I'm like, oh, maybe we have a significant find here. So we yet to be determined. We did find two algae mats, algal mats. 
Olivia found them both. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sometimes more concerned about crashing and things like that. And she was keeping her eyes up. And uh, this was amazing. This was a water source, random water source. And the, uh, the chain of lakes were up in here uh, to my left. You can't see them. Didn't I couldn't possibly include all the images because they only gave me 10 minutes. Well, uh, there's a creek down here and uh, the water flows down that direction. These, these filaments on this algae, which is a cyanobacteria because we looked at it, and I'll show you some images here in a second. Unbelievably how long, I, I couldn't believe that they were five centimeter and some longer. These are single cell chains. And so my guess is that this strain could be you know, quite old in terms of uh, it rec recovering every year and coming back. Really not able to determine that. I did bring water source back. So I'm going to test the water source to see what it's made of. Everybody knows algae was a part of the great oxygenation event, right? Without algae, we wouldn't be having this chat probably. Um, or we would be speaking differently. The, uh, the algae itself was a very, very thin wall algae. It was two nanometer. So we had, uh, Olivia was brilliant. She set up all of the methods to do all of this work. We gave her all the tools and she just showed us, me particularly, how to do all of this. Uh, she's a PhD candidate down at University of California, Irvine, and she's, um, she's actually studying astrobiology as well. And they're studying mice, irradiating them to see how they react. Apparently they don't do too well with radiation. One of the other mission directorates was to look for nanoparticles, particularly plastics and water sources. So any water source we found, we grabbed it, brought it back. I've got uh, a couple of liters of different types of water. Uh, I've got Resolute Bay seawater. I've got Resolute Bay icebergs. And, uh, and of course we pulled these from the snow banks around, around the facility there on Devon Island. Uh, tentatively, I can say we did see nanoplastics, but I can't give you 100% accuracy on that. I have to do some further testing on that. So I did bring all those sources back. And that's it. That was the, the quick deep dive. Uh, this is Mayon, where we got the sample for the iceberg. This is actually the Nunavut, um, in, in, excuse me, the Inuit. This is their house. It's well bones. They would crawl in underneath this and live underneath the whale bone, the whale skin. And, uh, and then this is Poli. We called him Poli. We didn't really have a name for him, so I called him that. And then there's the station. We've got to go back. There's more upgrades that are due. I did accidentally leave this flag up there. I imagine it will be gone when we return. And uh, yeah, planning ret to return next summer. Uh, I'll be there for uh, five to 10 days, just depending on how much needs to be done with Andy. We're going to have the station fired up and ready to go and uh, turn over the station to the two teams through the summer that we expect to have. Last, just to thank the Mars Society. Uh, they gave me a lot of flexibility uh, and money. And also thanks to the Nunavut government. And we're going to acknowledge them right now for uh, for allowing us the access to their land. This is their land and we're always gonna be good stewards to that land. And of course, Dr. Rupert, Dr. Ru uh, excuse me, Rupert, Dr. Zubrin, James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society, Eleanor Poli, Roger Gilbert, and Sam Ross, all on the mission comms. And Starlink was there, it's amazing. Unbelievable how it works. So I'll stop sharing. All right, well, thank you so much, Terry. Very, very fascinating and as a planetary scientist and planetary geologist, I'm particularly interested in Devon Island for the Houghton Impact Crater. Just wanted to ask you briefly: uh, Were you able to find um, along the rim of the crater, or did you have time to look for impact breaches or impact melt, that sort yeah. of thing? Both of them. Very cool. Next yeah. time you go, I'll. If, if it is possible to collect, it may not be. <laughs> Do they allow uh, you to collect specimens for scientific study? We were allowed to bring back uh, those specimens. We we had to hurry up and leave the facility. Uh, we weren't allowed to 
bring some additional weight that we would have liked to because we were all crammed onto one twin otter with all of our bags and the twin otter pilots were like listen man we've got to we've got to be really conscious of weight <laughs> and, and we'll weight, weight and balance as a pilot i know very much about that we did find both and the uh the impact um brescia i could I, you couldn't believe how a dense the material was and i'm sure mm -hmm. i'm sure it's the impact and then the heat i was just having it in my hand i was like wow you know 23 million years old in my hand <laughs> fantastic this is fantastic and really good news to see that uh, the facility is being refurbished after you know a half dozen years or so that we're bringing it back up to speed and that you're taking part in leading that effort. So thanks so much. Yeah. And we're going to move along here with Susan Jewell. And let me um, introduce Susan. Uh, we, ha we had a chance to meet via Zoom not too long ago, and it's good, good to see you here at our CISA uh, conference uh, once again. Uh, Susan is a space medicine physician and scientist. Uh, she has a lot of experience as an analog astronaut and an experimentalist, as well as an as an entrepreneur. And I, I can't wait to hear more about her M Mars um, project. She is the CEO of M Mars, which uh, stands for Mars Moon. Uh, Astronautics Academy and Research Sciences, where uh, she specializes in training the next generation of commercial analog astronauts. Uh, so this is really, really exciting. Um, and finally, she is the recipient of several awards, including the Marie uh, Marvin Gott Award in Technology and Innovations uh, for Space, and also the prestigious uh, National Space Society's Award in Pioneering Planetary Settlements. She, uh, well, we're delighted to have you here and learn about what you've been up to with oh, your analog research projects. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ed, and also Christine for inviting me to present. And yes, um, I've been in this field for nearly a decade. Okay, so so there's a lot to present. I'm going to try to condense it down into 15 minutes. I think that was the allocated time. So first of all, let me let me share my screen um, of the uh, presentation. And can you see my screen? Can someone say yes? No. <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. well, thank you so much. All right, so thank you, Ed, for the introduction. So I don't have to actually spell out the MRS acronyms, but definitely we've been deploying analog astronauts, one of the leaders, pioneers in this field since 2014. Formerly, it was called Mars Academy USA. We rebranded in 2016 to include the, the lunar surface. So... Um, we're very experienced in this area, and so I'm very excited to be able to um, to present the work that we've done, some of it, uh, because there's a lot, obviously, in the decade that we've done. And and so with that, MRS is very focused in these areas. But what I really want to emphasize is over the last six or seven years, we're also very passionate about DEIA. And when we first started, the whole concept of commercial astronaut was never even there in the in the lexicon of our language of space exploration. I I knew when I started this company um, ten years ago that commercial space astronauts will one day be a reality. So when we first started, nobody would even talk about the commercial astronauts. And here we are today in 2023. We really, that has actually become a reality. I'm so excited. So with that, the other thing about DEIA is because commercial astronaut is going to, the future of 
astronauts in space and living permanently in space is going to be very much the the model of 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 people here on earth so it is going to be very inclusive it's going to be very diverse and therefore this whole idea of dia and accessibility to give opportunities for others who are outside this field or outside this community you know, is critically important. So we, I am part of the United Nation uh, Space for Women mentor. We do, I do a lot of mentorship to bring in the underserved and the underrepresented. I want to emphasize this because this is not a strong enough narrative in this field. And we want to change that discussion, that narrative and op uh, offer the opportunities. And that's what we do under this, under our organization. We are a for-profit, we're, we're an entrepreneur business uh, model started you know back in 2014 and and with that we also able to offer these opportunities through scholarships through internships so i really want to we, we already kind of know all the different types of analogs because there's the hero that at the johnson space center and they've just got the 3d printed one that they just started a few months ago um but with m mars because being an entrepreneur mindset, we said, okay, how do we scale up this in terms of being being a business model? So when you look at the other, other uh, analog setting, they're really like set, it's a structure, you have to go to them, they can't really expand so much per se. So being a military background with my father, we said, okay, we're going to use the military concept of you deploy the mission anywhere, anytime, you conduct the mission, then you leave without a, without a footprint, right? So that is where we decided we're going to have a mobile, portable, expandable habitat. And this is in uh, up here in the upper left. This is our former um, uh, habitat that we're, these are pods connected by tunnels. But now the upcoming mission starting uh, in October of this year, we have expanded up to having these. These are NASA technology pods that are domes of different sizes connected by tunnels. This has allow allows us to go anywhere, any place. So we can come to you or you can come to us. We can have multiple, which we have done in the past, multiple stations. So you have, because you, when you think about the future, you're not going to have these small crews living on this planet surface, right? You're going to have settlements. You're going have more than one segment more than one base camp so you're going to have to simulate those those caveats or those um uh, situations here on earth and that is and this setup allows us to do that. of course as an entrepreneur and as a business allows us to scale up and that's very important to be able to get more revenue so this is where we're heading next so when you look at all these missions and even the hero it's a small crew which is great but for, since MDRS, MDRS at the Mars Society, they started this whole analog astronaut about, I don't know, 20 years ago, right? These, these are small crews, crew of six, maybe crew of eight. But when you really think about the future, and we are talking about settlements on planet surface, you're going to have more than these small crews. So what we're doing now is that we're going to expand our setup, and we're um, we're actually pitching for investors to expand not these small crews, but to actually have a, a an analog settlement. So in the in this setting, you could see you can have these big domes, huge domes that can even hold up to a thousand people. That could be like an amphitheater. They have different sizes. So what we're going to do is literally because we have our own land out in the Mojave Desert. So we're going to actually build the first analog settlement training facility. And because our background is very much focused on frontier technologies and in space medicine and space health and wellness, that is the first prototype model that we will develop out. So this will be what we call a SMARTY, and it's a Space Medicine MedTech Astronaut Academy research training and education. So we will actually, our vision in the next few years is to actually have analog astronauts who want to come in interested in space medicine, becoming future space doctors, involved in medical technology and so on and so forth, they will come in and the goal is to actually have up to 50 to 100 in full simulation of these analog astronaut crews that will then live for six months, one year to up to three years in full simulation. And this is the only way you can really test out 
many more, uh, you know, systems, closed loop systems, governance, governance models, which we've been testing since 2014. How, how can you devise or develop new governance model, which is, I think is critically important when you're going to have people living in ice, isolated confined environments, in austere environments, in space for long periods of time. You have to create a whole new governance. So we, we've worked out these governance, also closed loop systems in these small, short missions that we have to date even one year is too short, is to really develop out your closed loop system. How do you use agritech, biotechnology to grow new plants, to do stem cell, stem cells from creating new food and, and, and space medicine, right? How do you save a life of injured astronaut? Guarantee that if you're going to live in austere environments, especially in space, the, the risk of a life-threatening injury is going to happen. Right now on the ISS, they can't do surgery. They cannot do surgery 50 odd years in in space on lower earth orbit, we're even talking only lower earth orbit, we cannot conduct surgery. That is why it's critically important that we actually have these analog settings, but for longer duration and more of a community versus a a, a, a small crew. So this is where we're headed. So we have curated, validated, and really tested out our training uh, programs. So we have curated in 2019, it forced us to actually pivot because of COVID, because we, we, we couldn't conduct any in-person mission. So we created everything into our virtual astronautic training program, level one, two, and three. And so you don't need to come in if you don't want to come in in person, which you should actually, because it's a whole extraordinary experience and you can apply the knowledge in the, in a real practical hands-on sense. But you can come and be an, an a virtual analog astronaut as well and come in through our virtual training. But what we mandate is that you come in, at least go through virtual one, then you're allowed to come into our low fidelity. And we have been deploying multiple fidelities for many reasons, from low, mid to high. We'll show you some pictures and some of the missions going to high fidelity. And the reason is the fidelity for us defines the risk to life and death. So the higher the fidelity of the mission, the higher the risk of death or risk of injury to that crew, right? So so the, the complexity of that mission in infrastructure and the deployment of those missions at high fidelity is very important with regards to safety. It's basically similar to actually astronaut going to ISS, right? You have to have that infrastructure there. The low fidelity, the risk of death and injury is low, doesn't mean it's totally eliminated. So here it's just very high, but what I'm saying is our virtual program is not just coming in virtually you know it's an it's a natural training program you know like an academic program we have you on canvas canvas and you have to go through these modules and you're graded but what's so unique it's more of a hybrid program because if we have a concurrent in-person mission which is coming up in october november december when you come in through the virtual training, you have the opportunity to actually interact, come in to uh, join the remote mission support team or the mission remote medical team or scientific team. We have many remote teams. You can actually interact with the on-site crew and help them it, 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 during their EVAs, right? So this is very unique. So you actually able to have that experience as well. So you get a taste of what it is like to come in an in-person mission before you even come into an in-person mission, you see what I mean? So one of the biggest differentiator of our training program is we're heavily focused on frontier technologies, exponential technologies. So you could see just a some um, sort of a you know smorgasbord of all the different activities you get to come in and to do and engage in the technologies like tele robotics, like XR, spatial computing. You know, um, a lot of the technologies we use, you get hands on, and we have many projects, internal projects or studies that we've been deploying and conducting over the last ten years that we continue because obviously technology advances and matures. So you bring those in, you get a chance to interact and learn about it and work on it. So the, up here you can see us deploying to 10,000 feet here our first Mars medic we're the only company or analog tra training simulation program that has a Mars or space medics training program and coming up in October will be our fifth Mars medic or we can say space medics training so those who are interested in becoming future space doctors or interested in applying medical technology to support astronauts to live in space right this is what we we uh, give you the opportunity. So this was at 10,000 feet in Nepal, Himalayas. 
Then we went to 15,000 feet here at Amadablin Base Camp. But we were heading to Everest, but COVID hit. So we are going back to Everest Base Camp, not to climb Everest, but to Everest Base Camp to do the first pioneering, the first space medics, full analog space medics training program in 2025. All right, so we also have a lot of specialized training tracks that you can see here. But what I want to emphasize, because we're heavily involved in the uh, VC, the, the investor here in Silicon Valley, and we're entrepreneurs, we've been heavily involved with developing the entrepreneurial track. So what is that? That means that if you have an idea that you want to eventually test out and become a, a company, a startup, and go on the entrepreneurial track, you can come into our program, you can test out your ideas, validate it, collect data, so on and so forth, and prove a concept, your technology or your procedure, whatever it is. And then we can say, all right, we'll take you down the entrepreneurial pathway and help you with your startup and help you to be able to pitch for funding. That is so unique to us because we're heavily focused with, with this whole field of startups and entrepreneurs. In fact, you know, our company came out of X Prize out of Singularity University, Peter Diamantis, out of the, you know, Founder Institute and, and with Draper University, with Tim, Tim Draper. So we're very well versed with trying to, and a lot of the younger generation research scientists or business entrepreneurs, they don't know how to, to go down that path and we will help you and guide you. In fact, we would like to coin that astropreneurship versus entrepreneur. This is very exciting for us. We're now, since for you know a decade doing analog astronauts in this model, we want to expand out. So my co-founder, Emmy Jewell, she is a, a, a fighter, I'm not a fighter, but she's a pilot, commercial pilot, fly Lear jets for Medivac, but she's also a pilot uh, instructor. So what we're going to be doing later in 2024, 20, we are out, we're set out in the Mojave Desert there near the uh, space and airport, spaceport and airport in Mojave Desert. And we are going to actually procure two small planes so that we'll be able to offer uh, aeronautics. So uh, we will actually start the aeronauts, the aeronauts training that will be incorporated into our program, as well as to be able to offer parabolic flights or zero G flights in our planes, because she's also trained as an acrobatic flyer. So we can do parabolic flights and we can be able to say, if you want to do a research payload in our in our zero G parabolic flights, you can come to us. Or if you come into our astronaut training, you can, it will be integrated into the training program. And last but not least, if you yourself, because a lot of our participants actually want to be astronauts, they want to actually be able to learn to be pilots. So we can offer that as well. But that will be in later in 2024 that we will start deploying that and offering that. But what we're doing is the aquanautics training. And we are setting up the first series of, of aquanautics training in Q2 of 2024 off uh, Florida Keys. And it's not the same one that uh, Noah was saying. We're working with the Jules Lodge and we will actually be doing several missions or eventually monthly missions down there. And, and this this particular setup allows you to do full simulation underwater. And so we will be able to do, you know, EVAs at nighttime as well as daytime. So that'll be able to test a lot of our training protocols and, and especially our medical EVA. How do you, you save life in underwater and a lot of technologies that you can do. So the aquanautics is going to start in Q2 or 24. And then our lava north. So because we have the land out in Mojave and building that structure, we said the Smarty the med space medicine, we are able to also maybe eventually build underground tunnels. So we will be able to offer underwater, uh, underground training. But there are actually lava tubes outside Las Vegas. So we're trying to investigate and see, can we actually uh, use that for mis uh, analog missions and start training lava nodes. So we, uh, we're pioneered high fidelity missions to high altitude to Nepal Himalayas. As you can say, we've, we've run two two missions and we're going to Everest Base Camp in 2025. And the reason why we say, why do we want to do high fidelity missions is because at high fidelity, high altitude is as close as you can get to actually simulate the dangers of being high altitude mountain sickness. That's where a lot of the mountaineers, when they climb Everest, they die. It's because the high altitude mountain sickness affects your brain, your lungs. Once you have the symptoms, if you don't descend, um, of course, there's some 
uh, pharmacological uh, in, uh, medication you can take, but literally you have to descend as quick as possible, right, to be able to at least save that person's life. So what we are wanting to do is how to use technology, one, and to be able to um, mitigate and countermeasures for high outer amount of sickness. But also, can we, can we use this as an analog, because it's so dangerous and austere, to be able to test these uh, missions, right? So you could see here, you know, that it's uh, it's very austere in this actually, and, and this is our Mars medic training or, or space medics training. And, um, and you can see for a crew of six, we have over 40 remote teams of people. And these are flight surgeons. So this is very highly curated and very, very professional because you're looking at the risk of life to the individual in the crew. And most of the crew members here, you know, they were very mixed. Some were non-medical, some were med med medical, you know, doctors, space medicine physician. So this is a really interesting analog setting that we've started and we will continue uh, as we move forward. And going to Everest uh, base camp is 2025, but we will go back to these lower fidelity, high altitude missions as well to continue testing the, the um, the technologies that we're developing. And and I just want to say that here, we had to be heli factor out to descend because we went in monsoon season. That was something we learned, right? Don't go in monsoon season because all our solar powered equipment didn't work because we only had half an hour of sun during the day. And throughout the whole mission, they became door stoppers. And also, you know, it rained. So to descend, we had to be heli factor out, uh, heli factor down to, to a lower altitude. Um, and then also it was interesting because testing technology, it went down to minus 20, 25 at nighttime. Our, you know, our equipment froze, some of them never worked again. And, you know, so that's another reason why it's been able to challenge yourself in, with mother nature, right? With your technology, the human factors was a huge issue, behavioral. And obviously that's something we've been testing over the years. But DEIA has said we were re we have our initiatives, you could see here, we have the para astronaut where we're going to actually curate missions to bring in crews with disability, with LGBTQT, with, and I think this is important because I'm a baby boomer and I will, I actually experienced to be eliminated because of ageism at, uh, at the HERA because I was two months over the age of 60 and I they completed everything. And then they said, sorry, uh, you're two months over the age of 60, we can't take you. And I'm going, really? And so, and I've encountered over the years, a lot of the baby boomers, you know, who actually saw humans step on the moon when they were kids, right? And they they are not allowed to come in and have this experience and bring in their wealth of knowledge and skills. So actually, we're going to start curating what we call the Apollo notes. And these will be everybody who are baby boomers and you want to come in and come into our course, come in, we welcome you. Right. I think ageism should not be a, a barrier to having these experiences. So just quickly, and I know my time is coming up, a lot of the technology we actually, you can see here, you will encounter. So we've actually developed this, the first solar power 3D printer and laser cutter. We, we use that to train you how to use it, develop medical tools or every, anything, doesn't matter, you know, life support system. And then you're able to, to come into, to learn, to in, integrate it into the protocol. For example, this is going to change the way we're going to do surgery in remote areas and, and underserved areas. This is the first 3D printed anesthesia inhalation device that was actually printed out by astronaut Peggy Whitson in 2015 on the International Space Station. Well, that was great. They printed it out and they showed they could do it. But, you know, then you have to teach them how to use it. So that's what we've been doing over the years in our analog training is that these are all physicians and they learned how to use 3D printers. Amazing how people learn about the technology but never used it, right? So you learn how to use technology, you print out whatever, in this case, this vapor jet, and then you learn how to implement it. How do you use it in teleanesthesia or surgery procedure? So that we teach you this. Um, this is something that we will be doing. That's where the Smarty came out to expand it because over the years we we added on this space clinic and in this we use we train you non medical medical people how to do several of our you know to bring in the technology like for example three D printed robotic arm using spatial computing AR XR remote surgeon coming in or remote expert coming in teaching non medical people or non medical crew or 
medical crew, how to use the technology, how to do anesthesia, uh, anesthesia, surgery, medical protocols, so on and so forth. So this is the expansion of our Smarty that we presented earlier that we're going to expand out. Obviously, mental health and wellness, we've improved a slew of our projects. We've, we've published our work. We've got funding. So when you come in a mission, you do a whole slew of, you know, projects, countermeasures uh, in behavior. Psych we actually started the whole pioneering of space psych psychiatry, which I won't go into, uh, into detail here, but that's important when you know we're going to go long duration, permanent in space. Space psychiatry versus psychology is an important component. How do you diagnose and treat, you know, mental health issues when for astronauts living permanently long term in space on a flight service? So nutrition, we've worked with the NSS for the last four years, the National Space Society, an uh, ongoing project with uh, nutrition and diet. We incorporate that. This is a long-term study that we've been doing, and um, we were publishing some of the work, but we're continuing our mission. So we, over the years, tested multiple different types of diets and nutrition, because remember that adage, what you eat is what you become, right? So in our missions, we actually, in this upcoming mission, we're actually going to start a Martian diet. So the Martian diet literally is going to be high quality protein that will be from animal so insect source and from vegetables using biotechnology stem cells. Those are things that we bring into our missions, right? To be able to test it and be able to use, have the crew test it out. So definitely, and, and, and on this slide, you could see here when we, and I'm sorry if you could see here, this was when we went to 15,000 feet. And this little yellow dot here is our habitat, right? At 15,000 feet, this is our Amadablin base camp at, in, in Nepal. Look how austere, similar to what, uh, you know, Trevor was saying at the MDRS. But here, literally, we had to take everything up with us. And that's it. All the water, food, all the equipment. And, and if you ran out, that's it. And it was for that duration of that mission. But how austere, isolating, confined. You're literally on your own. But then on this one mm -hmm. slide here, Susan, I'm so sorry. I, this is so interesting. I, I could listen to you for another hour. I, I wish I had another hour to give you. I'm so sorry, but they're telling us that we've, we're have we over and we've got to wrap up. Um, this is a fantastic presentation and MR is an avatar medic do amazing right. science. Um, uh, there were some um, really good, there were a couple of good questions in the chat and I'm sorry we won't get to them. Um, but we'll we'll work with PSO to figure out how we can get the information, especially the people who wanted the link for DEI, um, DEIA, and um, and the ones who some people were interested in contributing to the company as well. But I just want to thank all of the panelists for um, for for being here for telling us about the amazing research that um, is being done. Um, particularly, thank uh, Elder. Um, Dr. Nihagosian for being here. He's our expert, and we are all. Um, just you know thrilled to have him with us today and um and thank you everyone who attended we appreciate you guys coming and hope that you enjoyed this session but i'm i think we'd better say goodbye so everyone can get to the next talk so sorry <laughs> so sorry to interrupt i apologize <laughs> thank you so thank much you. thanks so much folks <laughs> thank you thank you very much